right, well, fantastic. Good to be with each of you tonight. Would you grab your Bibles, open up to Numbers chapter 18 with me. Numbers 18. We get to consider tithes and offerings tonight from a little bit of a different perspective. Not paying tithes, but receiving tithes tonight. And so I'll consider what it, what it means to receive tithes uh, and um, put, our place, put ourselves in the place of the Levites for a minute tonight. I think it'll be helpful for us to, to consider what life might be like if you were a Levite and you received tithes and didn't pay tithes necessarily, um, although they did that as well. We'll, we'll consider that. So, uh, yeah, Numbers 18 and, and um, considering uh, just God's provision for us. What a blessing. All right, well, uh, receiving tithes. I still remember the uh, first week I came on to, to full-time ministry, and, and essentially I'm receiving tithes tithes and I and I didn't quite like it very much uh, whatsoever I was so accustomed to uh, working for a living now only work one day a week and well and one evening a week <laughs> as the common joke is for pastors uh, but I was so used to working with my hands and at the end of the week seeing what I built and then in full-time ministry and you realize oh uh, the tithes of the people are going toward my salary toward my livelihood and and here I am praying and studying and 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 at the end of the week like zilch zip like nada like I couldn't see one thing that I had built or done and and I was just kind of oh okay uh what's going on here but in, tr- in reality, I believe all of us as God's people are like the Levites, recipients of his provision, and that we are, are with that provision that he grants to us. Uh, we pass it on and we serve him. So let's consider uh, here in the Old Testament this, uh, the principles of tithing uh, and the Levites who were to receive those tithes, both the priests and the Levites. Now let's uh, just... Uh, Look at the first seven verses in Numbers chapter 18. And in these first seven verses, let's just consider the privilege of serving first, okay? Uh, The privilege of of serving the Lord. And these were those that were called to really serve the Lord full time as the priests and Levites. Uh, But God called us all to serve him. So the privilege of serving in, in Numbers 18, 1 through 7. So Numbers 18, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons... And your father's house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. Verse 1, as we consider the privilege of serving, uh, first thing we actually consider is the responsibility of serving, don't we? And this verse simply stated that the priests and the Levites would be would be responsible for the moral standing of the nation as a whole. And if the nation were wayward, they would bear that responsibility, that iniquity. And they were not only responsible for the nation's morality as a whole, but also for theirs individually. And so this is the responsibility of leadership. I believe any husband or father could like, liken the, the, uh, maybe the downturn of his family's morality as his own responsibility. Uh, he's not the only one responsible in the home. He's not the only sinner. Everybody else has choices. But I believe as the, the head of the home, a man could stand up and say, this is my responsibility. The same could be said of, with the, the spiritual leaders within a church. Are they not responsible for God for the spiritual wealth and health and, and well-being of the church? And so with great privilege, serving the Lord as a priest and Levite in full-time ministry came the responsibility and the oversight. It's why the Lord said judgment would begin at the house of God and even with the priesthood. Bring out the priest first, we'll judge them first. As with the priest, so, uh, so with the people. As with the prophets, so with the people. 
And then also, uh, let not many of you become teachers. You'll receive a stricter judgment. So the Lord will hold a teacher or a leader responsible not only for his own actions, but actually for the actions of those whom he has the responsibility of shepherding. So before we consider uh, the, the gifts that the priests and the Levites would receive, let us first and say, oh, lucky, you know, oh, they just get to live on the, the tithes of the people. Hey, let, let's stop for a minute and realize with that privilege of serving the Lord in the holy places and the provision that would accompany it, was this responsibility to the Lord for the spiritual wealth and health and well-being of the people. And so then now in verse 2, it says, Also bring with you your brethren of the tribe of Levi, uh, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and serve you or uh, be responsible with you while you and your sons are are with you before the tabernacle of witness. So in verse 2, the Lord, remember, is speaking to Aaron and And to Aaron, he's now saying, bring with you the tribe of Levi. So we remember that all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. So Aaron was of the lineage, it was a descendant of Levi, the tribe of Levi. And there was a certain priesthood taken from Levi's descendants, but not all of the Levites were priests. Some of them, according to the descendants of Aaron, would be priests later on. And so what we'll find in this chapter, again, is that division between the priests and the Levites. What did the priests do? The priests would minister within the tabernacle. They would touch the holy furniture. They would offer the, the sacrifices, and, and they would light the incense, set out the showbread, and the high priest, the, major, the leading priest, would go into the most holy place once a year on, on Yom Kippur, right? But the Levites were there serving in so many other areas, Uh, They would carry the the tabernacle furniture from place to place during the desert years. Uh, They would be there to clean up uh, the the animals and help with preparation of sacrifices uh, and so many other intangible things so that the priests could discharge their ministry uh, with the accompanying help of the Levites. And so notice that they were just come along alongside, uh, that they'd be joined with, to serve with. And, and so as we consider this passage of Scripture, uh, the Old Testament priests, Levites, in the order and the structure, it doesn't play right into the, into the present-day church in all its particulars. Because what you had is one priest, a couple of priests, Aaron and his sons, many Levites, but then all of the common people of the house of Israel couldn't come near the house of the Lord. So uh, a church is not structured that way, where there's kind of a high priest and then a few Levites, a few servants, but most people don't do the work. Rather, we could maybe look at it this way. God's called us all to serve. He's our high priest. We could maybe consider this, that the, in the Old Testament days, there was the tabernacles that was the center of the heart of worship. And, and this worship was attended to by the priests and the, and the Levites, and, and it was how the whole congregation entered in. Uh, we know several things from the New Testament that all of us have no, well, none of us have a barrier. We can all enter right into the holy place now. What a privilege that is. We also know that all of us have, have gifts of ministry within the body of Christ. And so in, in some ways you could say, well, as Ro- Revelation 5 and as First Peter chapter 2 do say, uh, that he's made us kings and priests. We are priests. We are a priesthood as, as God's people today. So not only would, could we apply the Levitical uh, hat to ourselves, but also that the very priesthood itself. All that's all we see in verse two is that there was this. Uh, they were joined together. I like that that they would be joined together. Even on in verse three, it says, "They shall attend to your needs," meaning assist the priests in, in the needs and all the needs of the tabernacle. But they shall not come near the articles of the sanctuary and the altar, lest they die. Uh, they and you also. So the Levites were not to touch the most holy portions. I think of this, though, when it comes to serving and being joined to service. And I just want you to put yourself in, in the, the place of, of 1 Corinthians 3, 9 and 10. And let's consider this. Uh, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. I like that. Uh, we are God's fellow workers. 
And, and we're working alongside. He's working alongside us. And so verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. So we know that foundation is Jesus. But then let each one take heed how he builds on it. Uh, for all of us, we have the privilege and responsibility of serving the Lord. Whether in spiritual leadership or lay ministry, all of us as Christians have the privilege of serving the Lord. And with that privilege comes a responsibility. And it's a real blessing. We serve together. We serve alongside each other, right? As the church, we do the work of ministry together, don't we? Verse four, uh, then they shall be joined with you and attend to the needs of the tabernacle uh, for all the work of the tabernacle, uh, but an outsider shall not come near you. And so again, priests and Levites were to do the work. The outsider was not to come near it. Of course, it's a little bit different for us. The, the privilege extends far beyond just a few today, as I mentioned. And verse five, and you shall attend to the duties of the sanctuary and the duties of the altar and there, that there may be no more wrath on the children of Israel. I like that. These were actual duties that the priests and Levites embarked on. This was responsibility, the offering of sacrifices so that no wrath would come on. So there was the continual offering of blood so that God would not be angry. Well, what are some duties that we could say are responsibilities for the church so that God's wrath might not come upon us today? I believe one of those is prayer. And for us boldly to enter that throne room and say, Lord, have, have mercy on us. And uh, like Job, even praying for his kids, uh, whether they had sinned, and, and just continually going to that throne room of grace and we're reminded that Jesus is our propitiation. His wrath does not come upon us because God's wrath does not come upon us because of the work of Christ. And as a Christian, I believe it's our duty to continually point one another to Christ, right? And, um, and so uh, we have that picture. Verse 6, behold, I myself have taken your brethren, uh, the Levites, uh, from among the children of Israel. They are a gift to you, given by the Lord to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Therefore, you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything at the altar and behind the veil, and you uh, shall, uh, behind the veil, and you shall serve there behind the veil. I, I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service, but the outsider who comes near you shall be put to death. Notice here in verses 6 and 7, one word shows up twice there. Uh, they are a gift. The Levites were considered a gift to the priests. And then in verse 7, uh, God says, I've given you your priesthood. He's saying this to the priests as a gift. Again, now here the privilege, the privilege of service. It was a gift. Um, let's consider the Levites being a gift to the priests. You know what it's like when you, uh, you have a lot to do and, uh, and then people come alongside you to help. Those people become a gift. Uh, what a gift is it when your kids grow up and they, and they can actually start helping out around the place and, and uh, you, they actually can do some real good. I mean, like, like, and then they become teenage boys and they can really start helping. They're lifting stuff you can't lift at that point. And you're like, man, you're quite a gift and you're a real blessing to me. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of names. N the word Nathan, the name Nathan means gift. The name Matthew means gift of God. And, and Nathaniel, gift of God. And sometimes I'll, I'll notice people within the church with these names, I'm like, hey, you're a real gift. But you know what? We're all a gift. We're a gift, what? To one another. And I believe that here in our minds, spiritual gifts come to the forefront. God says the Levites were a gift to the priests and that even the priesthood was a gift to them. And these are blessings. But remember, why, why does, has God given spiritual gifts? For the purpose of edifying the body. Not for showy, flashy performance. Gifts are not given to me for me, but they are to, given for others. One, a couple of verses in 1 Peter put that aptly. As each one, 1 Peter 4, 10, 11, uh, as each one has received a gift, now that you've received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then, and then according 
uh, and then uh, in the next verse, if, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability that God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. Oh, all, uh, like really all your teaching on spiritual gifts is limited, just packed right into those two verses. God's given gifts to everybody. They're to be used for the benefit of the body. They're to be, uh, we're to operate in God's strength and for God's glory, right? It's not for me. And that's the way the Lord set it up in the Old Testament as well. The Levites were a real gift to the nation as a whole. The priests were a gift. And even it was a gift to them to be able to serve that way. So uh, really setting up this chapter on tithes and offerings. First off, we just see the privilege and responsibility of the Levitical and high priestly ministry, right? But now we move from the privilege of serving. And I'll just say one more time to you. God's given you gifts. It's a privilege. And it's a responsibility for you to use those. You'll be a blessing to others as you do. There's a privilege and a responsibility of serving. But also now in verses 8 through 20, we find provision for serving. So not only is, is serving a privilege, but strength for serving is provided. And so here, from the privilege of serving to provision for serving, in verse 8, they would receive the tithes as that provision. Verse 8, and the Lord spoke to Aaron, here, I myself have also given you charge of my heave offerings and all the holy gifts of the children of Israel. I have given them as a portion to you and your sons as an ordinance forever. So we're going to read of the heave offerings and the wave offerings. And if you remember, the, the heave and the wave offerings could either be grain or body parts of animals that were, that were either heaved up, kind of lifted up to the Lord before they were, they'd be, uh, be eaten and shared by the priest as if to say, this is for you, or be waved in front of the Lord saying, Lord, this belongs to you or this has come from you. And in this act of worship is saying, Lord, thank you for this. But what would... What would be done then with the heave and the wave offering, whether it was grain or portions of animal, it would then be eaten by the priest and by the Levites. So a worshiper would bring a grain offering from his first fruits as at the end of the harvest, and they would have some grain. They would bring the first and the best of their grain or the firstborn of their animals and all of these, and they'd bring them to the priest. And then the priests would eat that. They would enjoy that. And that's how they would get their nourishment. Remember, the priests and the Levites didn't have any land. They didn't farm. They didn't have any fields. They didn't ranch. They didn't have any animals or food in and of themselves. They, they were nourished and provided for by the gifts and the tithes of the other 11 tribes. They would bring that. Or the other 12 tribes, since Joseph was broke and uh, divided into two, Ephraim and Manasseh, of course. And so these heave offerings would be given, notice, as, a, an, as an inheritance forever. Verse 9, this shall be yours. Notice the Lord's giving it to him. Of the most holy things reserved uh, from fire, every offering of theirs, every grain offering and every sin offering and every trespass trespass offering which they render to me shall be most holy for you and for your sons and then notice in verse 10 and in the most holy place you shall eat it every male shall eat it it shall be holy to you and so the Lord commanded the priests and the Levites who received this these offerings to eat it in a holy place and to really consider it something special that God has provided for me. And it is something weighty when, when you're receiving money for the work of the Lord or provision for something you've done in the Lord. And you're like, Lord, this has come from you as a gift. And so it is that we would say, Lord, thank you for it. And I think Jesus is a great example for us here. Jesus, remember, he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. Remember Psalm 50? God said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. From eternity past, that was Jesus. He had everything that he ever needed. It all came from him. In fact, he created it all. 
And then when he came to earth, he was made to trust just like the rest of us. And he didn't just make food for himself, although he could have. Satan tempted him. Why don't you just turn these stones into bread? You know you could do it. And Jesus didn't. Rather, he trusted in his father. And then when Jesus received food, every time we find Jesus eating in, in Scripture, you know what he's doing? He's lifting it to heaven and he's giving thanks. And he's eating it really in a holy place, a holy place in his heart. And he's saying, Lord, this has come from you. And I will thank you for it. Hey, you know what? We're all kind of like priests and Levites here. The Lord has provided for us. Imagine for a second that you had a very wealthy father, incredibly wealthy, and he's called you into the family business. And he's given you uh, access to all of his funds to discharge all of his business. And he just says this one thing. He says, he says son, daughter, I just want you to know this. I am a generous businessman. And I desire to be benevolent. And so with all that I have discharged, I just desire for you to be just, be, just be generous. It's okay to overpay. And if somebody gyps us, we don't need to go after them. But this, and you'll never run out. And I'll just keep supplying into your hand and you just discharge it. And you're like, oh, I can be, I'll be generous. But when it's my own, I've even realized I can be more generous with the Lord's money than I am with my own money. And wait a minute, isn't my money the Lord's money? As a church, oh, let's just get it. Let's just do it for him. Let's bless him. Then it's a time for Cheryl and I to give. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if we have, do we have enough to supply to give some to this missionary and that one and that one? And that, you like, and in all of this. So I was buying tickets to go down to uh, Stephen's uh, wedding for our family. And, um, and, and then we're flying from Brookings and we're going over to Detroit for a memorial for my stepdad, Steve. And so we have this little trip planned. It's two weeks in June. And, um, and so as I'm, I get the tickets, I, I select the seats, enter the names, and then there's something wrong with my uh, Sky Miles number. And so by the time I get that figured out with the Sky Miles number, it's timed out. And the tickets just increased 60 bucks each. <laughs> and now it's $240 more. Meanwhile, I'm chatting with the Delta rep and I'm like, come on, is, did this really just happen to me? She's like, sorry, nothing I can do. Nothing you can do. And then I, so I'm kind of like, like, oh, I'm going to eat it. And then it's just the next day I was just driving. And I'm thinking, I will never, ever know the difference between the cost of those tickets. Like literally. For the rest of my life, those tickets could have been $200, $240 more, $2,000 more. And for the rest of my life, the cost of, I will never, ever know the difference between that. And I just have this mind, like, I'm like, what is money? I mean, it's invented. It's, it's just a way of fixing value to a piece of paper. Give a two-year-old a hundred-dollar bill or a quarter. And here's the deal. I have a heavenly father who's exceedingly rich. And I know this about him. That he has said, I'm going to discharge into your keeping whatever you need for the rest of your life. And you just be generous. Does it matter how we spend our money? if money ultimately is nothing and we can't take any of it with us into heaven, yeah, it matters how we spend our money. But these are the only two things that matter about how we spend our money. Let's not go into debt and let's be generous.
or you could say save and share. And I say, if, we're, if, I'm, if I am just simply being generous, it shows where my heart's at. And I, and I don't want to overspend, be selfish, and just say more, more, more for me, more for me. And like, but because it, it's a matter of the heart, spending is. But you know what? You can save and share and have it all wiped out. And you know what? Your life isn't ever going to be any different one way or the other. Do this with me quick. <gasps> big, big breath in. <sighs> Let it go. That's going to happen until the day, the day that you die. And on that frame, you'll have clothes. And in that stomach, food. And that's promised to you from your God. And nothing else matters after that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain for whom? For you. Stop worrying about your money. You're a Levite in the house of your God. He's, he's, you're, you receive tithes. You receive God's provision. You don't have any inheritance here on earth. The Levites didn't have any land, any inheritance. You have all that you need. And that will be true for you as a child of God. And that, that refreshes us and that blesses us. And it reminds us that we are his. In verse 10 we or verse uh, uh, verse eleven. I'm sorry. Uh, this also is yours, the heave offering of the gift, with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. I have given them to you and your sons and your daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Notice this promise of provision was theirs forever, and everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Into all the best oil and all the best new wine and all the grain, their first fruits which they offer, I have given you. And so like this was just all of the best stuff. And this, all of this would be eaten uh, uh, once they came into the land. Uh, the, the, all the grain and the oil and all of this is, is, is future. Remember, they're still in the desert. And they're primarily eating manna at this point and water from the rock. And they're not sowing and planting. But eventually they'll come into the land and all this would come. And it would be such a blessing. And verse 13, and whatever first ripe fruit is in their land... Uh, which they bring to the Lord shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Notice that in the verse 13. Whoever is clean in your house for eat it can eat it. For the priests, they had to be ceremonially clean in order to eat this food. Let me ask you, what's more important? To be ceremonially cl clean or food? <laughs> what, what do you need more provision for? Tomorrow's bills or the provision for your sin. And no man can by any means redeem his brother. The, the redemption of their souls is costly. And we all love the word Jehovah Jireh, right? The, the title of God, God provides Jehovah Jireh. And now typically when you hear somebody saying, he's Jehovah Jireh, what are, how often is it used? It's used like, oh, he's going to meet your needs. He's going to pay that bill. He's going to provide for you. He's Jehovah Jireh. How's that used in scripture? We're not talking about money. We're talking about blood and the provision for souls and the ram caught in the thicket and the knife over Isaac. And don't kill him, your son. Kill the lamb instead. God will provide himself an offering. Jehovah Jireh. Hey, listen, where's your sin? What's your sin debit running? Your sin debt, where's that at? <laughs> Apart from Christ, it's pretty bad. Jehovah Jireh, it's all paid for. And listen, if Jesus died to forgive your sin debt, how much more will he provide your food needs <laughs> on this planet? He's a good God. And he, he's not going to let you fail. He is so, so good. And listen to Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. 
but rather seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And so the Levites were to eat of the, eat of the provisions that were given to them. Verse 14, and every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. These devoted things and everything that first opens the womb of all flesh, which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shall surely, you shall surely redeem and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. So of course, uh, Firstborn men would, would not be uh, uh, brought to the house of the Lord. The Levites were taken instead of them, rather than redeemed with an animal. Verse 16, and those redeemed of the devoted things you shall redeem uh, when one month old, according to your valuation. Hey, money's not wrong. They even had money in the Old Testament. Here's five silver coins. <laughs> the, the shekel of the sanctuary uh, was 20 geras. Uh, but the firstborn uh, of a cow, the, the firstborn of a sheep, and the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall rather, rather sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. And their flesh shall be yours. So the best animals would be theirs for eating. That's great. Just as uh, the, wa uh, the wave, the breast, uh, and the right thigh are, are yours. And all the, the heave offering... Uh, uh, and I have given to you, uh, uh, or, and all of the sorry, and all of the the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord. I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever, meaning salt would preserve. It would, that would mean that this was God's promise forever. It would never end. It would never end. It'll be a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. And the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance. You don't get anything else in your land. You don't have any inheritance in the land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. Don't you love that? The Lord says, guys, Levites, priests, you don't get anything. You don't get any land. You get me. I am your portion. The Lord is my portion and my strength. And him I will praise, right? And so it is the Lord, the Lord becomes our bread of life. At the beginning of 1 Corinthians 9, Paul makes a lengthy point about his right to receive financial gifts as a minister. This was something that would carry over into the New Testament church that gospel ministers in the New Testament would receive tithes from the gifts that would be given to the people. Paul didn't use those things because he didn't want anybody ever to think that he was in it just for the money. But he makes this lengthy point and he just talks about, we don't send soldiers out to war at their own expense and so many things like that. But in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14, uh, here he's referencing this passage we're studying. And he said this, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the altar offerings at, at the altar? That's how they live. And then he says, and even so the Lord has commended that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And that verse, 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Paul is saying that if I preach the gospel, he would say in that chapter, if I share in spiritual things, is it strange that I, I receive from your material things that you tithe and you pay my way as I'm spending my time studying and teaching? So those that preach the gospel live from the gospel. But I like, there's another way we can view 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Those who preach this good news live in the abundance of this good news. That's where they find their nourishment. Not on a physical plane, but a spiritual plane. Hey, if you're in ministry and you're serving others, you need time in the presence of the Lord yourself. If you're passing it on, you gotta be filling it up. The Lord's your portion. And how can you ever minister to your wife and to your children and to those alongside you if the Lord's not ministering to you and so we come into his presence that way, right? And so it is, the Lord is going to be our provider, not just physically, financially, but he's our provider spiritually, emotionally. 
He's a provider relationally. He's everything to us. And we come to him and we receive from him. He's our bread of life. And he's going to provide for us. And he just asks us to freely serve him. And so then at the end now, um, in verses uh, 21 through 32, as we, as we finish up today, um, we consider praising our provider. And we're going we're gonna to enter into a time of worship here in a few minutes. And in verse 21, we, we read, Behold, I have given the children of, of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they, they bear sin and die. Uh, so remember, they weren't allowed into that inner place. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. Again, they have that responsibility. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance, which is really just a recap. There'd be responsibility, privilege, and then also provision. In verse 24, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. And so the Lord was going to richly provide for them. Uh, and then, but now, let's consider their worship. Verse 25, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, uh, speak thus to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. What? They were to tithe from their tithes. <laughs> as they received, they were also to take a tenth of what they had received and offer it back to the Lord. It was actually a question of mine before I came into full-time ministry. Is the tithe just taken out like the taxes? <laughs> like, this is what we do agree to pay you, uh, but we're just going to give you 90% of it. Just we'll, we'll just hold your tithe. Like, no, you get the whole chunk. And then from that, we tithe. So I get a check from the church and we write a check back to the church of our tithes and offerings. Hey, why not just cut out the middleman? No, we're not just gonna cut out the middleman. I wanna worship and giving. I wanna be thankful for what I'm receiving and I wanna worship in giving and say, Lord, it's all from you and that's what our tithes are. That's what our offerings are. You mean I get to keep 90%? And you're just going to take 10 and it's, and it's literally 100% from you. And remember David said, Lord, who am I and who are we that we should be able to offer so freely and willingly and abundantly as this for are not all things from you and you've just given it to us. And when we're giving to you, we're only giving to you what is yours in the first place. It's all yours. And if, and it's just, this is just True church. It's just all his. All that we have is his. And we can freely share it. We've freely received it and we can freely share it. And there's some that give more than they ought and it, and it, it just becomes overflowing, shaken down. And, and, and there's some that withhold more than they should and it leads to poverty and those that are more generous than they ought to be, and it leads to great riches. And just the Lord says, if you're going to pass it along, remember like the feeding of the 5,000. He just, he took the five loaves and the two fish and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and they handed it out to the people. And every time they, and they're feeding all these people, so they're going back continually to the Lord to get more because they couldn't carry it all in the first place. There's 12 of them, and probably 13,000 people. So every time they went back to the Lord, there was more and they just distributed it. And every time they went back, there was more and they distributed it and they ate last. And they, there, was just, there was just enough. And that's literally what your life is going to be. You can go to him and receive from him. And he'll just make sure you always have enough to share with whomever you want to share with. And that's just who our God is. And so we worship him because of it. And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you there is a grain thrush, uh, uh, of the threshing floor and all its fullness of the wine press. 
Verse 28, thus you shall also offer as a heave offering to the Lord from all your tithes which you receive from the children of Israel, and you shall give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priest. And of all your gifts, and this in verse 29, and of all your gifts you shall offer up every heave offering due to the Lord from all the best of them and uh, the consecrated parts of them. I like the New Living Translation there. Be sure to give to the Lord the best portions of the gifts given to you. Also, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And verse 30, therefore you shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor, as the produce of the wine press. And, that, and you may eat it in, in any place, you and your households, for it is a reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. Notice, this would be their reward, and you know God has our reward in heaven. He's not unjust to forget our work of labor of love that we've shown toward his name, minister to the saints and do minister. Uh, hey, all your gifts are laid up in heaven forever there. Verse 32, and you shall bear no sin because of it, and when you have lifted up the best of it, uh, but you shall not profane the holy gift of the children of Israel lest you die. So they were to treat God's gifts to them as holy. They were to offer it back as worship. Okay, so uh, let's invite the worship team up. And as they do, I'm going to tell you about um, this phenomenal passage <laughs> in the book of Hebrews. Remember in Hebrews, um, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, remember Abraham met Melchizedek after he was returning from the slaughter of kings. And Abraham paid Melchizedek a tenth of all. And so who's Melchizedek? And we don't know. And the, the Bible says he's like a man without genealogy, without father or mother. And he's a picture of Christ. He just kind of shows up in the text. And, but then the Bible says, consider how great this man was. Hebrews 7, 4. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoils. And uh, the, that passage goes on to say, because Levi, who's to receive the tithes, was actually still in the loins of Abraham because it would go Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, and then the 12, and Levi was one of those. Like Levi was still in the loins, future loins of Abraham, and Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek when Levi was the one instructed to receive tithes. And so who's Melchizedek? Well, he's a type of Christ, and that's the point. And it's just saying this, that the greater receives the tithes. And so as we finish in worship, would you agree with me to say the Lord's greater, he's the greatest, and let's lift up our offering of praise to him right now as we conclude. Let's praise him for all his provision for our sin. He died and he rose again. Let's praise him for his provision for all that we need in every season of life. And let's just praise him because he's worthy of it. And let's just offer it back to him. Lord, we love you. We do worship. We praise you. And we, we give you our hearts. And we give you our all. And we just pour it out at your feet. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.